Atlanta University. I have the pleasure of being invited to serve as the moderator of this panel. We welcome all to our sessions, the notables and the rest of us. Uh, this panel is titled, The Contours, Contradictions and Contributions of Creating a Black Social Science, UNCOPS and the Atlanta School in Shaping Approaches to Africana Knowledge for Liberation. The context of this panel is a continuing exploration of the Atlanta School of Political Science and the upcoming celebration of 50 years of the department's PhD program in political science. As part of this celebration, a conference is being planned that will include further reflection and forward-looking agenda setting. Today's panel is the first contribution to this October agenda. It follows on the heels of last year's recognition program for Mac H. Jones at UNCOV's 51st annual conference. The panelists assembled today are current carriers of this Atlanta school. If a school is to become entrenched and dynamic, then every generation must step up and do its part, make its contribution. We have five accomplished members of this current generation who will speak to their understanding of key building blocks and contributions in thought and action of the Atlanta school. The panelists, Dr. Afia, Zakia is an independent African-centered political scientist, ecologist, and Africana studies scholar activist who explores the nexus of Africana epistemology, eco-philosophy, political ecology, and culture in shaping struggles for African liberation. A former assistant professor of African Africana studies at Morris Brown College. She was a recent 2019-2020 senior fellow, Walter, Congressional Black, Caucus Foundation and is a current Fulbright Specialist Scholar. She has lived and or done research in over 20 African countries on environmental issues, revolutionary movements, education, gender studies, and African indigenous knowledge systems. She is the current Vice President of the African Heritage Studies Association. Dr. Sikia is a graduate of the Clark Atlanta University Political Science Doctoral Program. Dr. Kurt B. Young is Chair of Political Science at Clark Atlanta University. His primary research area is on the subject of Pan-Africanism and Pan-African politics. Prior to Clark Atlanta University, Dr. Young taught at the University of Central Florida and held posts at other institutions of the historic Atlanta University Center, including Morehouse College and Spelman College. Dr. Young is a graduate of the Clark Atlanta University Political Science Doctoral Program. Dr. Kwesi Denson is an Associate Professor of Political Science and African American Studies at Florida A&M University. His research interests are in the areas of political ecology of the African diaspora, Africana agrarianism, and Africana political theory and social movements. Dr. Denson is a graduate of the Clark Atlanta University Political Science Doctoral Program. Dr. Kelly Harris is the Director of Africana Studies at Seton Hall University. Dr. Harris is a graduate of the Clark Atlanta University Political Science Doctoral Program. Professor Jared Grant is currently completing his doctorate at Clark Atlanta University in Political Science. Grant has an MA in political science from Clark Atlanta University and a BA in political science from Wilberforce University. As a community and political activist, Grant serves as a board member of Black Star Educational Institute, board member of the Black Man Lab Foundation and member of Let Us Make Man. We intend to proceed in the order indicated on the panel flyer. Given the time parameters, each panelist will present for 10 minutes to ensure adequate time for dialogue. Dr. Zakia's presentation, Free Your Mind, the Atlanta School and Mac Jones is decolonized knowledge, worldview and liberatory black power politics. Dr. Young's presentation, Systems of Repression and Underdevelopment Abroad, Mac H. Jones, the Atlanta School and the Pan-African Synthesis. 
Dr. Chrissy Denson. I am a son of Mac Jones, the Atlanta School and the institutionalization of Africana political thought. Dr. Kelly Harris, Reflections on Mac H. Jones and the Shaping of an Africana Knowledge of Liberation. Professor Jared Grant, Contextualizing Pedagogical Methodologies, the Atlanta School of Thought. All of you, panelists, have an elder's permission to speak. Thank you. Um, I will start things off. Greetings, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I'm going to try to talk fast because I wrote a lot. You know how we do. And I'm going to try to stick to my time and, and also see if I can share my screen uh, here and show a few slides as I go along. All right, so um, I'm going to, we, we all um, are going to talk about a particular aspect of Dr. Jones's work and, and how we feel um, we have been impacted in the contributions that he's made to um, the discipline and in our lives. I'm going to um, talk specifically on the concept of decolonization and the politics of knowledge production. So um, I am the daughter of Ida Dean and John Leo Smith from Wiggins in Picayune, Mississippi. Uh, I have a village of living and ancestral Jagna who include Matt Jones, Shelby Lewis, John Henry Clark, Kwame Ajaya Koto, Baba Hannibal Afrique, Mama Marimba Ani, and Jerry Algahaney, Ayikwe Arma, and many others. Lineage and genealogy is important in talking about your worldview and your approach to knowledge. Who are your teachers? I've been taught that we are, dispos we are a disposed and oppressed people. We are dispossessed from our homeland. We are an internal colony in the US and that we must be continuously in a fight to end our oppression. The challenge of blackness, as Lerone Bennett talked about, for us is to be free. To win and get out of this mess we're in, we must make sense of our reality with a decolonized mind. The first thing to know is that the situation of the last 400 plus years is not the beginning of our history, culture, or political struggles. I've been taught at CAU by having all of my teachers provide us with readings from Dr. Jones and then also having dialogue and engaging with Dr. Jones. One thing he's been clear about that I have heard more prominently described as psychological power by Wade Nobles is that power is the ability to define reality and have others accept it as their own. This kind of power is ideal to our oppressors because the cultural, social, economic, and political systems that they set up can operate without worry. The power holders can adjust the system when needed when rumblings come from below, call it liberal reformism, if you will, and keep on going. No physical chains are necessary. No desegregated schools are necessary. Just control the mind and thinking, the perception of reality, and you've got a new kind of slave. Mac Jones's work sought to counter the state of being among black people. He made clear our role and responsibility as Black African political scientists was to address how communities achieve all forms of power we need to be free, psychological or otherwise. For Professor Jones and any of his students who internalized what he taught, knowledge was always linked to power. He was clear that knowledge was constructed with the within the ontology 
of the cultural groups in question, and that knowledge production is inextricably linked to the structural and epistemological foundations of a society. His discourse on knowledge created through the theoretical frame of reference, frame of reference he created with the black politics and power relations analysis provides a wealth of wisdom valuable for African-centered knowledge production, which informs many prior and current Atlanta school students thinking. Today, I argue um, and elsewhere that a lot of this work should be embedded in Africana studies as a liberatory initiative, or at the very least, we continue to develop it within our Department of Political Science. So Professor Jones to me was clear, he was focused. His life work can be considered a major contribution to the global decolonizing knowledge efforts of black scholars and academics concerned with black liberation and sovereignty, including those who taught him. Uh, Mac Jones was um, taught uh, by Jewel Prestige. Um, he taught along with Dr. Shelby Lewis and he taught um, Dr. Elsie Scott and others who are part of the women who I want to add to the Atlanta School uh, as key uh, individuals who would help, help shape his thinking uh, and his, his work um, both organizationally and professionally. I also want to mention that um, part of what all of them sought to do together was to raise the issue of using liberating frameworks and approaches that ch challenge Western political science and social science. Indeed, they recognize white supremacy as an enemy of our people in particular, and generally the power struggle we engaged in with the dominant Euro-Western epistemology and worldview that seeks to control the political economy of knowledge production needed for African liberation. I also want to relate Dr. Jones's work and the decolonizing project I felt he was a part of with that of Jacob Carruthers. Dr. Carruthers was also a political scientist and they engaged in similar decolonizing work from complementary spheres in intellectual warfare. Carruthers, via the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization and his institute in Chicago at Northeastern Illinois, and Dr. Jones through AHSA, African Heritage Studies Association, ENCODES, and of course, the Department of Political Science, among other institutions, were where they engaged and decolonizing work for black liberation. They contributed to creating a space where any discipline, particularly African studies, could become the sacred zone for their students and where organic intellectuals could maneuver and conduct what I call intellectual guerrilla warfare. Let me start quickly where I'm going to end in a few minutes. Black lives dehumanized and crushed under Euro-American Euro colonial slavery and imperialist capitalism in the US must be free, not just matter. The empire that created our oppressed conditions is falling. We are at war, but we are going to win. Freeing our minds from neo-colonial Western theories, concepts and approaches is a first step towards being free and even revolutionary or just sane agents of change. Until we decolonize our minds, political science will remain a tool of dominant social control that exists across cultural, political, or economic spheres of the old and new formations of nationalists, read international dominant white power structure. We will think we are not at war and losing if our minds are not decolonized. So what did Mac Jones do to challenge us in this quest for liberatory, uh, a liberatory um, and, and black social science? 
He created a decolonized approach to methodology, epistemic framework, and approaches to understanding Black life, past, present, and future. Some of the um, critical work around decolonization that he shares uh, also have, um, or that I share with him, also has been informed by this notion of uh, tracing our history and our culture, but also reading scholars like Claude Ake, who also engaged in the decolonizing process of the social sciences. What does decolonization mean? Decolonization is the process of deconstructing colonial ide ideologies of the superiority and privilege of Western thought and approaches. Decolonization involves dismantling structures, not just ideas that perpetuate the status quo and unbalanced power dynamics that we find in society. A decolonized mind has the ability to, to discern recognizable power relationships between the colonizer and the colonized or oppression and avenues of resistance. So decolonizing the mind from Ngugi means use became a useful conceptual tool through which to understand the ways in which power imbalances were practiced as culturally encoded automatic reflexes. Let me say that again, culturally encoded automatic reflexes. Culture is everything. So clear about the need to decolonize political science. He, um, in 1969, wrote his uh, Black Frame of Reference for Politics, um, which has helped to explain Black life politics and, and our experience in all of its complexity. Uh, I, I, uh, looked at Ricky Hill's uh, work on Mac Jones and he um, articulated three premises to Jones's political theory that comes from his frame of reference for black um, political science. First, we begin our analysis of the black political predicament, recognizing that in large measure, our situation resulted from the structure of racial domination. Second, as a racial group, Blacks could not be made to conform to the accepted logical analysis of European ethnic groups. And third, the human and social relations which defined everyday life between Black people and white people were structured by power. So his dominant subordinate group model, which was an extension of power theory, meant that we should see politics as a struggle for power, universally and black politics as a local manifestation of this global power struggle. Professor Robert Smith, a colleague, Jegna in his own right, also noted that Jones frame of reference theory says it more plainly, says it more plainly in his analysis. Social science knowledge cannot be objective or value free. It is colonized knowledge Blacks and whites are adversaries. We are at war. So central to the creation. Two minutes. How much? Two minutes? Two okay. Minutes. Yep, I'm winding down. So central to the creation of a Black political science is his understanding that white supremacy and power dynamics are a function of what of a European, white European culture and worldview. So being a Black political scientist with a deftly um, broad intellectual formation, Dr. Jones's frame of reference was theoretically, methodologically, and analytically perceptive. It has helped his students better understand the political economy and social history of contemporary America, Africa, and the world from a broadly critical and radical perspective. The relevance of studying Jones' epistemic logic and practice and the policy implications of his work is that it aids in establishing an important area within the creation of an African social science, an African political science, if you will. Um, I will end by just, um, let me see if there's any other um, 
things in the last two minutes. Um, what I want to show, um, and I think the others who are talking will continue to outline the contours of his theory and his um, frame of reference and um, his practice. But one of the things that you get from his teaching is this, the idea of history being important, but that how we need to begin to reconceptualize what African political science or black politics or black social science should look like means that we need to go to the source, right? So these are some of the sources that I've used in my teachings and, and things that I think are references that we can use in our work. Finally, I'll mention uh, one other aspect of the Atlanta School that um, has been con has continued um, for, for decades now, and that is decolonization at CAU inspired by Matt Jones is carried out through the weekly seminars that we have where we have people from everywhere come and talk and share ideas and challenge each other to think in the interest of black people and to, to, to formulate a black agenda for our people. And most of all, and I'll end with this idea, uh, a decolonized uh, black social science or political science does not um, condone a deracialized um, political strategy. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Dr. Young. Okay. I want to, okay, there we go. I need to share my screen. First, before I, I, I start sharing, I want to say thank you if, to everyone for uh, joining us and, and, and Thank you to uh, you, Dr. Jabril, and um, uh, Dr. Zakia for pulling this panel together. Um, and I also want to take a, a quick second to recognize uh, our dear uh, uh, comrade, brother, um, creator of the uh, um, of the Department of Political Science Graduate Program, uh, our first uh, chair of that program. Uh, Dr. Mac H. Jones, um, we affectionately refer to him as Baba Mac. We love you and uh, we glad to see you here with us. All right, so let me uh, get started and share my screen here. All right. Okay, can we see that? Okay, as you see before you, my piece is entitled Systems of Repression and Underdevelopment Abroad. Mac H. Jones, the Atlanta School and the Pan-African Praxis. My name is Kurt Young. I'm currently chair of the Department of Political Science here at Clark Atlanta University. And this piece is a part of, actually it bridges two manuscripts that I'm working on, two big book manuscripts. Uh, one uh, uh, has been accepted for publication um, with African World Press entitled Fighting to Unite. That piece deals with the fractures and, and fissions and, 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 and con contestations within the Pan-African movement. Uh, and the second piece uh, builds on the first in the pursuit of developing what one might call a political philosophy of Pan-Africanism. Indeed, Pan-Africanism is my work. Um, uh, I conducted my uh, initial research on Pan-Africanism while in the Department of Political Science. And um, two of the members of my committee are here. Dr. Jones was the chair of my committee and Dr. Jabril and Dr. Here, Marvin Here were my um, actually third and second readers. Marvin was my second reader and Dr. Jabril was my third reader. And so this work is very much a product of the uh, experience at Atlanta University, at Clark Atlanta University Department of Political Science and it continues to be my work. Uh, so let me move forward and, and see how we can capture this. Uh, the, what I want to do first is kind of begin where I end, which is to make the argument that when we look at Mac Jones's praxis as captured in much of his work, uh, 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 I argue that 
we can extend it and apply it in places where we might not have seen it so readily utilized. For example, we are very much aware of Mac's work and its relevance to uh, political science writ large. Um, it's certainly been utilized as, a, as a, an approach, a lens uh, for our understanding of black politics and black political science. And uh, in addition, uh, it's been very useful for those who are on the ground trying to understand ways to uh, address the challenges confronting uh, African people, particularly here in the United States. I argue though, that um, it is time for us to extend Marxist praxis to understand this notion of Pan-Africanism, but to specifically utilize it as or for the development of a conceptual framework. Now, to get to that point, and in, in, in line with this, uh, um, this conference, I wanted to reflect on Mac's specific work on uh, NCOPE's uh, 20 years later, published in 1989 as a part of um, uh, um, the National Political Science Review. When I first came to Atlanta University, Clark Atlanta University, I, um, my first introduction to Dr. Jones's work was through his presentations at NCOPE's. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, the role of the responsibilities of the black political scientists to the black community and this essay. Um, in fact, I think I read this essay first and then I had a chance uh, uh, in Dr. Jabril's class actually to uh, uh, see his seminal work on the responsibility of the black political scientists. And so I use this uh, uh, as a reference to or as a lens for this conversation. And uh, I, I hope to have enough time to come back and link it to this notion of the Atlanta School. Dr. Jabril is correct. This is a concept that we have been talking about for some time and uh, we're moving uh, and forward in the, to the next step in convening a major conference to uh, really explore the implications of, of that notion of an Atlanta School. And then lastly, um, the linking of this conversation to this notion of a Pan-African synthesis. Now, what is this Pan-African synthesis? There are three basic assumptions that I take for granted in this notion of a Pan-African synthesis. Uh, it, is a, it is in many ways a response to the tendency to identify Pan-Africanism in discrete components as opposed to an, a holistic uh, phenomenon. Uh, and so I capture those in the thought that there are core theoretical elements that comprise Pan-Africanism's liberatory function. Right. For example, this is not an exhaustive uh, 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 statement on this point, but it includes these, at least these four uh, uh, aspects. This notion that Pan-Africanism contains within it reference to and strategies for both political and economic strategies. Uh, for liberating African people. Um, this again push, pushes against this notion of uh, um, um, a, an economic focus in some voices and as opposed to a political focus in other spaces. It also builds further to argue that central to Pan-Africanism as a liberatory practice is this notion of cultural consciousness. Right? So that there must be some, as Bernard Magubani refers to, ties that bind. And so culture uh, uh, from this notion of a synthesis has to be a core element in that notion. Um, it is both local and global in its orientation. Right? And in terms of liberation, Pan-Africanism is a liberation not against simply violence imposed upon African people, economic exploitation of African people, uh, uh, racial discrimination against African people, Instead, we assume that Pan-Africanism is a struggle against systems of oppression. And so there's a systemic agenda that's at the heart of Pan-Africanism. It also assumes the synthesis that these core elements have been extracted and absorbed into other movements and formations, in many cases that are not Pan-Africanist, but have close similarities to uh, uh, Pan-Africanism, both in terms of its philosophical orientation and in terms of its objectives. Um, the, the difficulty here, though, is that when this occurs, those elements of Pan-Africanism that are absorbed in these other formations, on the one hand, they remove those elements from their legitimate space within the Pan-African movement, 
and they legitimize those elements only in the context of how they fit into these external types of formations, even in the cases where those external formations have similarities with a Pan-African orientation, which then leads to analyses by some that Pan-Africanism, for example, uh, does not have a philosophical component or Pan-Africanism does not have a class analysis. Some of these uh, uh, statements that we've heard, um, this notion of a synthesis attempts to try to understand what has happened and then to formulate a response to that. And of course, it leads to the third point. Um, this notion of a synthesis connects to the thought that what should occur now is the need to restate Pan-Africanism in its holistic form as opposed to those uh, um, uh, forgive me for the term, but those bastardized uh, expressions of Pan-Africanism that again are removed from the core elements that speak to its holistic notion. And I conclude at the end by making the case that pan uh, uh, Mac Jones's conceptions of the meaning and function of black political science actually provides a framework for understanding this synthesis. I'll be rather quick here just because of the importance of time I can use the whole section uh, session talking about defining Pan-Africanism, but I operate under four basic assumptions in defining Pan-Africanism. It makes reference to an understanding of Africans as a part of a global family, a global community. Uh, central to a Pan-African conception is this notion that historical and cultural consciousness are key elements in doing Pan-Africanism. It is both continental and diasporic, local and global, as I mentioned a moment ago. And Pan-Africanism functions as a collective mechanism for the liberation of African people, right? Not just simply the unification of states or the unification of people around, along notions of race. Um, the, <clears throat> the conversation emerged out of a discussion that uh, we had a few years ago, as Afia mentioned, uh, one of the highlights and strengths of the Department of Political Sciences uh, um, program is our, are our Tuesday seminars. And one of the important guests of our seminar, uh, Professor P.L. Olamuba, uh, came and he talked about his, his views of Pan-Africanism and its relevance to uh, um, those experiencing, uh, uh, those of the Black experience in the United States. And he made a point in one of our conversations that what had to happen now, as is one of his concluding points, was that there needed to be a synthesis uh, in Pan-Africanism. And so my work picks up from that dialogue that we had uh, back in 2018. Right. And so this notion of a synthesis includes, uh, uh, again, some of the key points that I mentioned a moment ago. Right? It includes this notion of, uh, of uh, political, uh, I'm sorry, I, I mentioned this piece already. Let me move forward. My apologies, everyone. So NCOPs, NCOPs. So, I wanted to use this piece because I thought again that it was timely because of the conference, but also because I thought that it was one of the uh, works of Jones that really captures uh, 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 many of the broad statements that can be comprised in his work, uh, in his body of work. And in that uh, presentation that he gave uh, at NCOPES and, and again published in the journal, he offered one, a critique of ENCOS as an organizational space, more of a reassessment. Uh, he reflected back 20 years later on what, on what had evolved within um, uh, ENCOS and, and, and left us with a, a, a very sound critique of where the organization was going uh, by 1989. I think that uh, it would be an interesting to hear us have a similar kind of discussion today. Uh, and arrive at some interesting conclusions and compare those conclusions today to what Max said in 1989. He reaffirmed in that piece his previous notion of the responsibility of Black political scientists. He talked about the responsibility, the responsibility including notions of movement against systems of poverty and decadence at home and repression and underdevelopment abroad, uh, hence the title of this piece. Um, he talked about knowledge production for anticipation and control needs. And finally, as one of the kind of glancing points that he makes in the essay is to introduce the Atlanta University Department of Political Science as an organizational space in the context of uh, the first point, right? Where he was talking about um, um, how INCOPS emerged as an organizational space. And he then uh, cites the Department of Political Science as an example 
of, of what he envisioned or what was envisioned in the, in the uh, um, at the establishment of the doctoral program in 1971. Um, two minutes. Two minutes. Um, and so the idea here is that I wanted to reflect on the meaning of that circa 2021. Now, <clears throat> one of the key points that Jones makes in that, in that discussion, sorry, one of the key points that Jones makes in that discussion is his reference to this, what, we ref what I refer to as this repression and underdevelopment. Um, he talks about this notion that Reagan, Thatcher, the Reagan-Thatcher policies that, that uh, raised the economic exploitation and political repression of third world peoples uh, have raised uh, the economic and political, political repression of third world peoples uh, to unprecedented levels. They have reinforced in equitable international division of labor that results in the systematic transfer of wealth from the impoverished lands of the third world to the affluent countries of the West. He also argued on this note that the economic strategy of the West is supported by the companion military strategy called, for example, low, intention, low intensity conflict, which declares that the United States is in a constant state of war with people of the third world. Right. And so his reference to Thatcher and Reagan uh, and the implications of their uh, global leadership uh, um, um, on people of color throughout the world and certainly uh, parts of the African diaspora, you see here to the left an image of, Falk uh, of um, uh, the British ex escapades in the Falkland Islands in the early 1980s and to the right uh, uh, an image capturing uh, Reagan's campaign in Grenada. The notion here is that these these aspects not just represent political and economic realities, but they also capture the notion that uh, uh, um, um, the struggle that Mac is articulating were struggles not against just again political and economic realities, but they're struggling against systems that reflect those uh, elements of domination. So he argues here um, towards the end of the piece, uh, and this brings me to the final issue that I want to raise. And that is the need for us as individuals and as an organization to become involved in efforts to develop an authentic movement against systems. There can be no, there can be little doubt that the oppressed condition of blacks as a group is systemic and therefore can be changed only through fundamental changes at the systemic level, at the systems level. The same can be said regarding the plight of oppressed of the third world. This opposition to system would enhance the prospects of challenges to the system. So what I argue here is that his reference to the notions of, 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 of anticipation needs, I, I, I hope we can get back to this uh, in the Q&A, but his notions of, uh, of the anticipation needs and how this grows out of the experiences of the rank and file of the masses and how it reflects these, the, the worldview that belongs to that group uh, as shaped by their experiences provides the basis for and signals for how we can pursue this notion of a pan-African synthesis, right? Um, that pulls these elements together, that connects this notion of, uh, of a, a type of struggle for liberation, a pan-African liberatory struggle to confrontations with matters of economic and political import, but are grounded in the cultural experiences of African people, right? If we argue that worldview is key, then worldview is a product of a set of forces and key among those forces that shape worldview are those cultural forces. And, and Afia uh, spoke to some of those points earlier. And so this then I argue provides a useful framework for pursuing this notion of, of capturing um, both the types of divisions that and schism that occur in Pan-Africanism and prospects for developing a more coherent, holistic understanding of a Pan-African political philosophy. Um, I'm going to stop um, by just sharing a couple uh, images as I wanted to speak to the, um, the Atlanta University space. This is an image uh, that was captured by, um, um, we took back in 2012, I think it was. Uh, you see some of the presenters in this photo here. But what this image captures are many of the uh, of the last students, the last generation of Mac Jones, uh, when he uh, was at Clark Atlanta University towards um, the middle part of the, of the of the 2020s, I think it was. Um, you're gonna have to help me with that um, date. 
But the point though is that I wanted to capture here was this notion that um, his work continues as Dr. Jones mentioned. And many of us who you see here and captured in this image, you see here, we have a listing of uh, many, many of his uh, um, members of the last generation of his students. You see the kind of works and, and, and production that was generated by um, that generation. And the question that I wanted to uh, wrap up with is what are the implications of this continuum, this continuum um, um, for the continuation of Mac's work? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next presenter, uh, Kwasi Densu. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen. Uh, greetings to everyone. I'm going to try to make this as clear as possible. And I'm just going to uh, read my presentation if it comes up correctly. Uh, and if, if I, my main screen is here, so if I go back and forth, uh, it's because I'm trying to keep uh, my focus. Ah, have to move. Okay. All right, there we go. So the title of the title of my presentation is "I Am the Son of Mac Jones: uh, The Atlanta School and the Institutionalization of Africana Political Thought." And uh, this is like a second response to something that was written a while back. And I actually shared it in Cope's a critique of Mark Antony Neal's uh, Black, Black Schools Kill Smart Niggas. All right. Uh, this brief discussion seeks to clarify and explore the, ah, okay, I got to grab this. Clarify and explore the significance of the Atlanta School as an expression of the institutionalization of Black social science practice and its attendant commitments to the development and defense of African communities. It reaffirms the relatively simple argument that African people, notwithstanding a commitment to living in solidarity with other groups, need and must continue to build Black-led institutions that perpetuate the cultural worldview and interest of African people. For a variety of reasons within the context of the Western Academy, we are often encouraged to produce new knowledge as if the time of its production and or its break with previous held assumptions is in and of itself valuable. This discussion makes a break with that notion and its epistemological assumptions. We are reaffirmed the idea of Sankofa, i.e. that one must look back to move forward, that the past and present are two complementary realities. In addition, that the true value of knowledge, old or new, is fundamentally rooted in its capacity to transform the human condition, not necessarily in its novelty and or break with previous traditions. Uh, finally, throughout this discussion, I'm gonna use the terms African and black interchangeably given their historical use within these spaces. Uh, to speak of an intellectual genealogy, uh, I'm talking about the intellectual genealogy of the Landon School and its significance. Uh, one must assume that human beings are in fact social creatures. Um, we are a product of our local environments and the social forces, forces both internal and external that shape them. I'm having some technical, okay, that shape them. Um, we are an extension of the accumulated knowledge of previous generations as they, as they express themselves in formal and informal contexts. To say one is the son of Mac Jones in the social and intellectual context is not to suggest that one is influenced by his intellectual work and practice alone. It is to reaffirm that one is substantively connected to the lineage of cultural workers and institutions that he helped to build and maintain. It is to suggest that one is a product of that lineage and has a particular responsibility to pass on that inheritance, so to speak. It is to suggest that one is rooted in an expansive legacy of community and ideas, and that one is committed to expanding that legacy, clarifying its assumptions, correcting its deficiencies, and passing it on to future generations. The establishment of the Atlanta School in 1971 was an attempt 
to institutionalize Africana political culture and its social political mandates in the US context. It sought to contribute a new tributary to what Donna Vincent Harding has eloquently described as the ever flowing river of, of black struggle in his seminal work, There is a River. Uh, at its inception, the Atlanta school practice was predicated on the assumption that as human beings, we are inextricably linked to our communities, i.e. groupness. In other words, personal and collective identity and development are inextricably linked in the dance of life. Within the human context, ethnicity serves as the substructure through which other forms of groupness express themselves and through which disparate groups relate to and interact with one another. By ethnicity, I mean categories used to define human communities based upon common ancestral, biological, linguistic, cultural, geographical, and historical ties. This should not be confused with the concept of race, its social construction, and its preoccupation with phenotypical characteristics. Although an enduring aspect of Africana political culture, given the history of racism, Defining one's group in relationship to the other, i.e. to oppositional external forces is necessary but insufficient in its capacity to develop a group consciousness and lifestyle that are not simply preoccupied with what we are against, but more importantly, what we are for. At the same time, within the US context, one cannot understand Africana political culture and thought absent of analysis of conflict between groups. Hence, Baba Jones in the Land School's grounding in an analysis of the relationship between dominant and submissive groups. For this reason, I am speaking of what I like to describe as an organic nationalism, a term that I can unpack more fully in the dialogue portion of our panel discussion. Uh, the Land School, like other expressions of Africana political culture during the era that gave birth to the emergence of Africana studies was founded upon the assumption that black cultural workers must have two primary concerns. One, knowledge production and dissemination grounded in the worldview and interests of African people and communities. And two, the social and material reproduction of those communities, hence the need for institutions. Uh, this emphasis on institutions cannot be overemphasized. Amadou Hampatam Bob reflections on Bamana culture is important in this regard. Uh, institutions are required to ensure the social and material reproduction of the group. Institutions are required to mediate relationships between groups, be they positive or negative. Institutions help to perpetuate and secure the intergenerational transmission of cultural knowledge, education, both practical and theoretical. So Amadou Hampatamba's reflections on Bamana culture, present day Mali communities are instructive in this regard for Doma, the knowers and seekers of clear knowledge. Uh, the degree of a Doma's evolution development is measured not by the quantity of words. In this instance, we can refer to words as paradigms, journals, articles, books, they have learned or produced but by the conformity of their life to those words. Um, this echoes Baba Jones' notion that the Lana School was created not only to create scholarship and conceptual devices that allow us to capture and build into our research and analyses both racial and economic factors, both the material and psychological dimensions of politics, and to capture the essence of the US political economy and culture and the place of Blacks in them, we also have the responsibility to be involved in liberating political practice and our con commitment responsibility to interpret our actions and those of our compatriots. This is the not, not to suggest that the production of written knowledge is not relevant. It is to suggest, however, that it must be twin to concrete practice in the process of creating and building and maintaining community. The call for institutionalization was a natural byproduct of the Atlanta School's critique of Eurocentrism and Western bourgeois scholarship traditions. The creation of the scholar activists in the service of African communities and African liberation became its primary focus and, fret and, and thrust. This emphasis remains its primary concern, its attendant perceptions of how students, communities should and can be influenced by its presence and existence. 
In addition, the presence of an Atlanta school is both concrete, a physical community in space and theoretical, challenging our preoccupation with black ac academic circles in black academic circles with paradigmatic, paradigmatic issues alone, absence of substantive institutional and lived expressions of our worldview and interests in the real world. And uh, for this, and we can unpack this in the discussion period, speaking of the challenges that come with careerism in the academy uh, and that are very much influenced by a dominant submissive group politics, specific, specifically as it relates uh, to black social scientists concentrating alone on paradigm issues in, in the absence of being able to practice the paradigm uh, in the real world because of, of fear and or equal unequal power relations. And then the last slide is just to outline some of the core values and assumptions of the Atlanta School, uh, clarifying the practice of NCOPES and then African social science. First and foremost, this idea that we are African people and that the African nation, as he often terms it, is at the central of our analysis and of our concerns and of our practice. So we speak first to this community intentionally and in a progressive sense. So it's, it's always uh, very relevant where you position yourself and how you talk to people and who you actually talk most to. Uh, as Kurt discussed, a commitment to Pan-Africanism uh, and Black internationalism, that our struggle is interconnected and interwoven with African people across the globe. A commitment to challenging, envisioning, and creating a new society absent of European cultural hegemony and its attendant values of competitive individualism, white supremacy, capitalism, and sexism. A commitment to building and controlling African institutions for African people. And a specific commitment to seeing HBCUs in general, the Atlanta School in particular, and their associated activities as part of a network of community-based institutions committed to the development defense of African communities in both the US and the global context, hence the institutionalization, uh, or hence institutionalization as a central feature of the Atlanta School. I'm, that's done, Dr. Jabril. I, uh, thank you very much. Okay. You, you, you ended on time. Okay. And so we appreciate that very much. Uh, the next uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Harris. Then, so you may have to stop sharing. Ah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Harris. All right, here we go. All right. <laughs> so let me share my screen. And uh, you said Densu ended on time. I didn't expect him to end on time. Densu has never ended on time in his life until today. No. So that, that's a good he's, thing. He's under heavy manners today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't have a, I didn't intend to do a PowerPoint, but I saw my colleagues were doing one. So I said, well, let me do one. And I hope whatever little contribution I have, it can go better than um, my comprehensive exam. Dr. Jones was on my comprehensive exam. And that was the only time I ever cussed at him in my life. It was under my breath, of course, he doesn't know this. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Jabril, Hashim Jabril, Marvin Hare, um, George Kia were the other members of my comprehensive uh, committee. I, I go through answering these questions and then I get to Dr. Jones. And if you all, anybody ever had his class, you know, he, 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 he has a way of asking questions that can sometimes be confusing. And for somebody with a limited vocabulary like myself, you know, I, I probably didn't understand the, the question he asked. So when he asked the question, I got nervous and I just downloaded my brain and threw everything at the question. So I answered the question, took a long time answering the question. Then I, I sat back smiling, happy, thought I answered the question well. 
And I said, well, did I answer your question? And he says, you spoke to it. <laughs> and at that moment, I, I cussed under my breath uh, at Dr. Jones. But at any rate, um, let me let me get to this. And, and we calling it a, a, we're talking about, this title was selected for me. Kurt didn't want me to have untitled. I was just gonna have an untitled presentation, but that, Kurt said that wasn't sufficient. So um, thank Kurt Young for this title. Um, these issues we've been thinking about for quite some time. Um, and I interviewed Dr. Jones a few years ago and did a and did a and did a piece on Dr. Jones um, because I think that his work, as important as, as it is, it has still not been really grappled with, and that's something that I think the incos that we should really we really need to do, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I also think what we're calling the Atlanta School is really kind of a misnomer um, because when we think about uh, the work of Dr. Jones. Uh, we really got to think about Jewel Prestige, Twiley Barker, Adolf Reed Sr., Rodney Higgins, that Southern University that he, that he started out at. And even before that, because to me, folk knowledge becomes very important. What we get from mama and papa, even before that, when we think about Oakdale, Louisiana, and, and his father, who had just a third grade education, but had J.A. Rogers on the shelf and Richard Wright on the shelf, uh, things that exposed uh, Mac at an early age. We got to think about that when we're talking about intellectual history and understanding, unpacking why people do the things they do and, and how we come to know what we know. Um, and what Dr. Jones would always ask, how do I know what I think I know, right? So we have to raise those particular questions. But now this, this, this whole idea of this black political science piece. Um, and as you see here, this is a quote from uh, uh, Mac, the override, overriding purpose of Amer American education is antithetical to my own purposes. And that's something to remember. And the thing that, and I pull these things out just from some of the work that Dr. Jones has done, and my colleagues have mentioned it, the responsibility of Black political science to the Black community, a frame of reference for Black politics, scientific methods, value judgments in the Black, and the Black experience in the United States, Black predicament in the United States, NCOPE's 20 years later, political science and the Black political experience, issues and epistemology and, re and relevance. These pieces he wrote, were intended to have to start a dialogue, a debate, to be a framework for understanding black politics, not and for a developing a discipline of black political science. Right? Um, so we really have to raise this question about how academic disciplines develop. And he 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 raised us and he challenged us to think about that. But I would argue that that's not a question that many of us still think about. And I would I would even I would even go so far and to say that. I don't know that NCOPES has really grappled with that um, uh, in his early years. I, I, asked, I asked Robert Smith about that, and he said, well, you know what? NCOPES really didn't have, uh, didn't even go through a phase where um, there was a lot of theory building. You see that in Black studies, um, but you really didn't see that in NCOPES, and primarily because people came from so many different positions. People looked at the people who came from so many different positions. So we really didn't have that, that dialogue and debate that probably should have happened. Social science inquiries, in, idiosyncratic to the people being served. All social science is parochial. Now, the question that, that we have to really consider, is this still the case? And yeah, I've been in, I've been in, the, in the debate the, over the past, what happened here? I've been in debate over the past couple of days with, uh, with Dr. Earl Henderson. Um, I'm sorry, my screen just changed on me. Just a second. I've been in this dialogue with Dr. Earl Henderson, you know, and, and the question has, has American political science changed? Um, has it expanded uh, enough that it's th these kinds of questions, these kinds of observations are no longer relevant? Mark, I think they are. I think that they are still relevant and it's still something that, they, that we need to develop. Need to develop. Um, this whole idea of what is a black political science and what is a black social science. And here's a quote from Mac that again, this is this to me gets to him again saying, well, we really didn't have a debate about my work. He said, I was surprised by the reception responsibility received. I thought I would get more critical feedback. And of course he's talking about the responsibility of black political science is his presidential address to the national conference of black political scientists. He said he was surprised by the reception. And, and what I took from that is he thought it would be more debate 
around it, more dialogue around it. And, and I think that we still need to have that dialogue in terms of what is our responsibility? What charge do we have? Is NCOPE's, is the, is the idea, is NCOPE's organized just as a professional organization, but also is it, is it also an arm of the black liberation struggle? And if that's the case, we have to really raise questions about, well, what is black liberation? What is, and if that's the case, if there is such a thing as black liberation that's required, what kind of academic disciplines do we need for that? Can we acquire, can we reach that in the American Political Science Association? Can we reach that saying that we're just good American political scientists, good American social scientists? Those questions we have to raise. So when we're trying to unpack and develop this whole idea of black political science, um, we need to go back and be empirical about our observations in terms of the black political experience. And I think that that's happened in many ways. Um, we need to, though we do need to unpack the function of American political science. What is it? Second, we need to talk about historical markers that I think that are important for us that are distinct from American political scientists. Third, what problems do we identify? The need for liberation is just one, but I think that that's something that's also been under theorized and that we need to really grapple with. Uh, what scholars do we hold in high regard? Uh, of course, we go back to the boys. Um, of course, we talk about Mac Jones. Of course, we talk about Shelby Lewis, uh, May King, Jewel Prestige, Alex Willingham, and so on and so on. We need to really develop that bibliography and read their works and grapple with their works if we're really going to have discourse, because in discourse is really is an intergenerational discourse. So we have to build on those works that people did before. We have to grapple with, the, with what they did before. And I don't think we've done that in a significant and a, in a meaningful manner. Um, and concept formation and normative prescriptions, those are all things we need to, to grapple with. All right. So those are my just my few thoughts and musings um, in terms of where we need to go with our work, with Mac Jones' work. We need to build on it. We need to take it seriously. We need to try to have these debates about it. And we need to just say, is, is there black political science or not? Is there black social science or not? Um, and that's it. And I, hopefully I can get to, we can have some discussion around it. Thank you very much. Again, another uh, concise and conformed uh, presentation. Uh, the last uh, presentation comes from Professor uh, Jared Grant. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, and uh, protocol being established. Thank you very much, Dr. Jabril. And um, I will maximize the screen. Um, so my, my, my title is Contextualizing Pedagogical Methodologies, the Atlanta School of Thought. Um, and and I, I, I wanted to just briefly just say that there are other schools of thought. And, and what's been important is that that the that Africanists, um, um, folks of Black politics, have their own school of thought, and we have one, and and we have to, as uh, um, uh, Dr. Denzu talked about, uh, um, institutionalize our own um, 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 schools of thought. And so, when we look at the Chicago School um, with um, Milton Friedman, and we see what was done or accomplished as a result of. Of, of, of this Chicago school with neoliberalism, with, um, with Chile, um, with the teaching of uh, Latin American students and then taking to, to Latin America uh, a destructive um, um, politics as a result of what was learned from the Chicago school. But we here at the Atlanta school, what has been done um, um, with our own technology um, as it speaks to um, scholarship? So I, I'm, I'm dealing with contextualizing pedagogical um, um, methodology. And these are just some general ideas around um, what that actually means. And I won't go too deeply into it um, because I want to approach this as a student and what it has meant for me. And so I take an experiential approach to this um, and um, as a student, um, in um, the Department of Political Science at Clark Atlanta University. So um, hopefully you hear me well. So when you talk about roots in the family tree, 
um, what are my roots um, when it comes to this particular department? And uh, my roots started with Dr. Marvin Hare. Um, I was at Wilberforce University um, and um, my second semester as a freshman political science major, um, I get this doctor um, by the name of Dr. Marvin Hare who introduces me to um, this book that makes me say this to everyone on this, uh, on this panel and um, um, in the audience. Where were you when you were enlightened? Where were you when consciousness actually just, just spawned? And so I was in a classroom as a freshman in um, uh, Dr. Marvin Hare's class. And what he introduced us to was this book called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And, 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 this, and this brilliant doctor by the name of uh, uh, Walter Rodney. And then I began to enlighten, begin to be enlightened by new ideas. I didn't know that I was African. I, Almost, you almost didn't know if you were black. You just knew you were black, but not African. But, he, but those ideas allowed me to go, and I think in 1988 or 89 to my first NCOPES conference, right? And so, which was right here in Atlanta. And then it was here in Atlanta where I saw um, a, 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 a different type of spirit, the zeitgeist. This was a time where black consciousness was really rising. You know, I was born um, during the Black Power Movement, but you know, but my intellectual birth was during the Black Conscious Movement during this '80s and '90s period. And then coming to Atlanta, I began to spawn new ideas as a result of going into these classrooms, and then actually going into the AU Center on um, um, on um, on Broadley Avenue, um, talking to others about some um, deep intellectual discourse. Um, if we talk about the migration patterns and the first universities in the world where we talk about Egypt, Kemet, and Ethiopia, and so on and so forth, and if we talk about the migration patterns that occurred, um, bringing us to um, University of San Cori and, Tim, and Timbuktu, these were spaces, Africanist spaces that were, that were cultivating Africanness in a certain way. But Dr. Hare, what he did with me and what he did with others is that he had right there in Dayton, Ohio, at his home, um, what was called the Sankori Institute, where we would come and learn about a, a different canon, a different standard, a different um, 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 literature, a canon of literature that was ours that we needed to learn from. And so it was with this literature that I began to ask certain questions and then wanted to go even further in my learning. And that, that of course, gave me the rise to begin my um, approach to coming to Clark Atlanta University, formerly uh, Atlanta University. So I, I come to Clark Atlanta University, I come to this department, and then I'm, I'm um, um, new types of thoughts are, are brought about. Um, what is this concept of the dialectical? Uh, development, underdevelopment, dichotomies of power. You know, um, reading texts like um, um, Karl Marx and Das Kapital, and understanding the the this dialect these dialectical relationships, these opposing relationships. Um, uh, understanding development from folks like a, a, a Rodney and underdevelopment. Okay, and so this began to open my mind to um, new approaches and to understanding the world as it was. And then being in Atlanta, of course, it began to increase my ideas on um, and be able to meet others because Atlanta was a central place where folks came from all around um, and coming into this community in order to learn, in order to exchange, in order to uh, share and collaborate ideas. And so this was a, a truly um, um, rooted ground for this type of education. So I, so I deal with this ethnography, which is um, um, <clears throat> originally a lot of uh, 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 research was done from an, eth an ethnographic point of view. You get a lot of European folks, explorers and, and writers who would always other everybody else, never doing this to their own culture. 
never looking inside their own culture, but othering other cultures and then defining what that was. So you get all of this literature from the West that talks about the African, that talks about other cultures, but they, of course, it is, it is creating a, uh, um, a, 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 a capital of literature in and around um, um, that others um, um, African people. And so we get in the 19th century, but it's not until the 20th century where we begin our scholarship that we begin to question what was going on in the 19th century with the scholarship that was being done. We get folks like Charles Darwin, The Origins of, of Species. This was one of his original titles, but we, we don't see that title in, in the other editions. And what it says in the second part is the preservation of, a, of, of favorite races in the struggle for life. Right. So this gives you an idea of this systemic racism, this international system of racism and dominance as a result of the social construct of race. And, but again, I get to question that because I began to understand this process of the dialectical, the dichotomy of, of understanding two different forces that are contending with one another. And then it has a, a literature that's found within it. So I'm, I'm into decolonizing these methodologies. This school of thought is into decolonizing methodologies. Um, from this one scholar, concerned not so much with um, actual technique, oh, excuse me, of selecting a method, but much more with the context in which research problems are conceptualized and designed and with implications of research for its own participant. And in this book, um, she's identifying what decolonizing methodologies mean and also providing um, a more discovery in the, this concept of methodology, but this concept of decolonizing methodologies. She also gives a great uh, um, 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 definition of research, a set of ideas, practices, and privileges that were embedded in the imperial, imperial expansionism and colonization and, in, and institutionalized in academic disciplines, schools, curricula, universities, and power. Again, fashioning a foundation for our understanding of why certain methodologies were sought and created in order to dominate um, 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 other methodologies. And so uh, social scientists, like ourselves had to be created in order to combat the politics of social science. And so here we have Dr. Mac Jones, um, who can, uh, who, who's, who's um, um, creation of the Department of Political Science and, and gave us a charge. And this is one of the charges that I, I, I actually love quoting. It is our deepest, it is our responsibility to re reinforce the legacy of the liberation struggle here and the struggles of the oppressed peoples throughout the world and to suggest viable models for that struggle and to give theoretical tools to those who would be cadres in the movement. Uh, that quote gives us our charge as political scientists. And I, I got my, my three elders, of course, um, who also helped um, me to fashion other ideas and, and, and our questions in and around the American political system, our, our questions in and around black politics itself. Um, Dr. William Boone always tells us what is the political milieu. He asks us to challenge the social construct. He asks us to define these social constructs. And just in this example, it, we, we, we would have a deeper conversation about the domestic terrorism that began as a result of um, um, Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, and then um, through, that, through those years, what occurred by the time of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and, and utilizing the research that was done by Kenneth, Kenneth and Mamie Clark from the psychologists who, uh, who were critical during Brown versus Board. He also had us looking at Haynes Walton and black politics. <laughs> And this other idea of white male suffrage that we see in the early 19th century, and what that meant to the construction of uh, to the construction of the United States, um, and getting um, poor uh, white men to be able to vote 
and then create and establish an American system um, by and for white males. Dr. Hashim Jabril, our moderator. Um, uh, one of the texts that I really love is, uh, that was uh, published in the Phylon is um, 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 uh, Methodological Matters in the Study of Africa and Appreciation of W.E.B. Du Bois, African and Scholarship. It is a great um, text on understanding me methodology and actually applying it. And so what I've learned from him is that, that what he says is methodology matters, the student of Africa must be mindful of the premises shaping questions posed, answers sought, what and how data are gathered, how findings are arrived at, what conclusions um, 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 are asserted, and what policy suggestions are proffered. These issues are not simply a matter of good and bad science, but more fundamentally philosophy, social commitment, training, and craft. And so again, I, I look at these questions of, 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 um, of methodology. I come to Du Bois who he was speaking to and talking about uh, just as a, a matter of um, his mixed methods. Uh, and he did that of course in the Philadelphia Negro. And so, and how do we utilize some of these tools um, and, and follow and craft a technique um, um, that that looks at black politics, that looks at blacks in our in in, in our um, uh, in our social um, engagements, and in this one, of course, we know that his mixed method becomes a um, a, a bible towards um, uh, good research and and why researching is so effective and important, and then as well as he researched us and that studying us by us is an important factor in, um, in social science. Two minutes. Yes, sir. So in, our, in the canon of um, subfields, um, I, I found some folks that I, 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 uh, I really love to, uh, to study in, inside of our canon. So um, political science has subfields and history. But see, I look at history from a political point of view um, strongly. And John Henry Clark is one of the best that does that. He takes a political position in, in how he describes and contextualizes history, along with Walter Rodney as well. Psychologists uh, like France Fanon. So uh, we've talked about the sociologists like uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. We, talk, we can talk about the international relations that Horace Campbell's talks about when he talks about Pan-Africanism. Um, in international relations and not just realism, uh, uh, neoliberalism and other um, um, concepts. And then of course, we talked about American politics, Haynes Walton, and, and uh, um, now I'm mentioning uh, uh, Ronald Walters uh, in and around black politics. So we have a canon and at the Atlanta school, we were, we've been able to um, um, create a culture that can study in and around these topics and that is sacred space that we can do that. This is also one of my favorites, Sheikh Antija, um, because he used both physical science and social science to prove um, so much about the African origins of civilization, um, as well as African origins of, of, um, of um, humanity itself. And I'm then we have it. these depart departmental seminars. This is it, uh, Doc. Mm -hmm. um, this is from our departmental seminar. Just pretend everybody's black in there. And, um, but this is actually from a, a Japanese parliament. And that iron sharpens iron. And what we, what we served in departmental seminars is to ensure that we all um, um, were able to answer questions um, and able to deliver in such a way and defend ourselves in that delivery. And I, I know my time is up. So. Um, that's it, the Atlanta School, the uh, safe and sacred Africanist space to contextualize, theorize, reflect, and analyze. Thank you very much, Professor Grant. Well, those are the presentations. Snapshots of two hour presentation each. Uh, I think uh, Professor Zakia said that she would act as a discussant. I don't know if you wish to still do so. Uh, if not, then we just launch straight into the questions. I think we can just, let's have some dialogue. 
Um, yeah, let's have dialogue. Do we have any questions in the chat box? Let's see. Anybody want to raise your hand? Jamie? Okay, go ahead, sister. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Beasley. Um, this was an amazing presentation. Um, I'm just overjoyed and a bit emotional at all of this knowledge. I'm so thankful to be in this space with you all. I'm a third year doctoral student in the department. Um, I sit for comprehensive exams at the end of the month. So, um, <laughs> so um, I just had a quick question for Dr. Harris. Um, you mentioned uh, that NCOPE's were you asked if NCOPE should be a Black professional organization or an arm of the liberation movement? And my question is, um, why do we have to choose between either or? And that if we understand and, and, and if we understand what we're trying to do and we're decolonizing knowledge, um, the the separation or the dichotomy piece should should be left out, right? And we can use the space to do both. So well, were you I saying that we should do either or, or both? Okay, so I think NCOPES does the professional piece. And I think the emphasis has been on it as on the professional side of being professional. Um, and I think that oftentimes when you focus on one thing, you have to overemphasize something else that may be more important. So when we look at the black condition, when we look at all the problems, these protracted problems that we continue to have, one of the things that we really have to consider is what is it that we're not doing or what have we failed to do? What have we failed to do, particularly as black scholars, black political scientists? So I think the emphasis needs to be on our role in the liberation struggle. What, what is it that we do? What is it that NCOPE should be doing? What is its mission? What is its values? What is, what is its raison d'etre? What is it that we're supposed to be doing? So I say that we should emphasize that because um, the professional piece I think has always been emphasized. I'm not saying discard it because people got to live but I'm saying that uh, it should be, we should emphasize the other piece. So really emphasizing scholar activists, right? That Dr. Jones brings to us, right? Just so I'm clear. Yeah, I mean, people use those terms scholar activists. Um, that's fine if, if people want to use it. But I, I think a part of, I think our role as scholars is to really supply, to support activist work um, as scholars. A scholarship. And I think we just need to be grounded in scholarship more. I think sometimes there was a discussion yesterday on Earl's panel uh, about this whole idea of, of, of scholars and activists. And um, sometimes I think when we use that term scholar activists, um, we do, we diminish what activists actually do. Yes. Because um, they do a lot. And, yeah, and we say the scholars, our scholars are doing the same thing as activists sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, muddle. So if I can take the liberty to follow up with that, um, what then do we uh, say when people ask, is your theory grounded? And if uh, your praxis, if theory, your practice informs theory, how does that work? And, and let me just, um, before you answer, this is for anyone. Um, I just wanna recount a personal uh, incident to kind of buttress your point, Kelly, but also I'm, I struggle with it. Um, I was visiting Ayukwe Arma in Senegal and one of the things that he talked about because he also wrote, wrote about it was um, how when he tried, wanted to go to South Africa and join the liberation struggle, they looked at him and they said, no, what you do as a writer is far more important to what they felt was important for his contribution to be to the, to the so-called liberation struggle. And, and clearly, <laughs> you know, there is no mistake uh, in, in, in that what he produces is, is phenomenal. But just to make that point that, you know, he actually was like, had tears in his eyes because he said, you know, he, he was very strong about that. And he actually told that story in Atlanta at CAU, right? In a seminar that we had when we brought him to the States to go on a tour. But he had shared that with me. 
before. So there is a, you know, there's a conflict that you will have. And certainly from coming from CAU, you know, if you don't have it, you know, something's wrong that you feel like you must be an activist and a scholar to blend that and mesh that. But too, I should say too, you know, uh, the, the Atlanta University, uh, one of the things about it that made it so unique um, was that so many activists joined the program in, in, in the early years, that it was a that it was a space for activists where they thought that they could do um, scholarly work, meaningful scholarly work. I think, let me, let, let I me mean, just say, I, I'm sorry. Let me just, uh, touching on Afia's point, uh, there's a quote that I often reflect on and share with uh, students, it's from uh, uh, Cabral, and he's talking about national liberation. And he said that one of the major challenges for the national liberation struggle is, is the failure to understand the reality that it is that we are seeking to transform. And therefore, one of the critical needs of any kind of liberatory activism is proper understanding of uh, the realities that we confront. What, are, what is the primary co contradiction? What are our secondary contradictions? Who are our immediate enemies? Who are our fundamental enemies, etc.? And that the role of scholarship, the role of the intellectual, in many ways, is to speak to those issues as well. Can I, can I say something? Sure. I'll do it real. I think it's how we conceptualize scholarship too. So, I mean, you just read from Amilcar Cabral who wrote a lot mm. and, and was active. And, and typically when we talk about activism, it's, it's work done to confront external forces, mm. right? Primarily, you can be active in the community in terms of building institutions that are life-giving and development oriented. You can be active in, in confronting external forces or, you know, quote unquote, enemy or those contradictions external to the African community that impede our development or, you know, the obstacles. Um, so that's one thing, how we define activism. Another thing is how we interpret or conceptualize knowledge production in uh, um, the development of scholarship. It can, it, it, you know, typically we look at it as an individual pursuit, right? It can be a social pursuit. It can be a collective pursuit. If we took the position that everybody in an academic institution needs to be rooted and have a relationship to a community-based institution, and there's, there's inferred in that is there's necessary collaboration between the institution and the quote unquote scholar in, in is cooperative production of texts or, or work. That's a form of scholarship because at the end of the day, the work is relevant to the degree it transforms people and our understanding of reality. So how it's produced I think that's questionable, and especially in this context that we live, where we make a living doing it, we often do it in isolation, right, uh, and a whole lot of other stuff. So it, I don't think the dichotomy has to exist, uh, and for most part, I, I guess for most of the history of the world, it hasn't existed in the way that we engage in it now. It hasn't. You won't find institutions like this in other parts of the world prior to the modern period. So I, I got a lot of questions about what we consider an activist and scholar so forth and so on. Okay, can I add a quick point before we shift? Um, uh, I want to roll back a little bit more to the essence of Jamie's question. And I think that's an important question a direct path to the answer though has to be through some, some serious honesty and, 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 and some hard-headed reflection. I remember, let me tell you what I mean by that. I remember it was 2016, I think it was, we were meeting in, um, in um, Jackson. And I think the question of NCOPE support for the 
anti uh, or for the the uh, the boycott, sanction, and disinvestment uh, movement came to the floor, and I, it was interesting to see the tension emerge. And when I was reading uh, that piece by Dr. Jones, he talked about the, a decision early on in, in the creation of NCOPES to consciously avoid claiming a 501c3 status because the organization did not feel, the organization felt that it did not want to be bogged down when it was faced with those kind of questions in the context of very concrete movements taking place across the planet and in, in uh, Black America, if you will. Um, and I remember listening to that de debate in 2016, and, and, and actually I was sitting by someone who I, I won't mention so he can speak for himself, who was, said to me that we would not have had this discussion um, a few years ago, or some, something uh, of that nature. So the point that I'm making that the question as to whether or not the space can accommodate both scholar, activists, uh, or, a, or any, any other binary that we want really has to uh, um, be held against the reality that the institution has a vote, right? Uh, um, INCOPS is an institution. And so a beginning point in the answer to that space and whether or not that space can sustain that kind of, uh, of flexibility is for the institution to clearly state what it is, right? Where it stands on these, uh, on these questions and if indeed as I, I've heard it said in, in, in Max's piece, and I heard it said most recently in, uh, in, in some works that uh, Brother Kelly has developed, if there's indeed a sense of careerism that is a part of the full thrust of the organization, then that's a vote, right? That's, that's, a, that's an honest answer. I mean, that's an answer. We just have to be really honest about what is gonna be the lean of the organization so that we can then uh, talk seriously about whether or not it can accommodate uh, um, um, those two or any other third or fourth or fifth type of expression. There's yes. questions in the chat if yes. Earl, Earl you. raised and other people raised. Yeah. So Earl, Earl raised a question around the building blocks of uh, this Atlanta school. Uh, and uh, it's a fulsome question. And so if anybody wants to read the chat and briefly respond to it, please do so. Uh, Jared, can you answer that one, the building blocks? I think we had some discussion about that the other day. Okay, let me read it um, if you wanna to move to another one and I'll come back um, and answer it next. Okay. For some reason, I am not getting my chat to move, can't seem to scroll through it. Hmm, let me see. Okay, hold on a second. So there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a I, I don't know what happened to the chat for me. It's gone. So there's, there's, there's also a, a question, question about I the degree to which Okay. Yeah, uh, students at PWIs. I mean, is is this institutional building that we're talking about? Is it just limited to HBCUs, or does it also embrace uh, kind of liberatory black scholarship at PWIs? Which I thought was an interesting question as well. San Francisco State had one of the first um, um, black studies programs, so mm -hmm. that certainly um, not the case. Um, so definitely a PWI can be, um, can be grounds for um, creating liberated space. America would be that as well, as well in general for, um, so um, definitely um, in that context, quickly said. Can I just add one more I, I think I think that would be a, a very long debate. Um, it's been ongoing for a long time where you need to be. And I think um, most of, to me, those who have influenced the Atlanta school, uh, including Mac Jones himself, made conscious decisions about space and place to struggle. And uh, it is 
uh, I mean, we know that HBCUs are not, uh, you know, liberated zones, free zones. We know where their money comes from. We know that they are, you know, when, when, when I was teaching in Africa all the time, you know, we would talk about those institutions being, you know, cheap imitations of white institutions and, and a lot of the HBCUs are. I mean, we know that their role and function, who, they, who, who started them, um, the, the role that they've played in um, perpetuating Eurocentric knowledge is clear. So, um, but I, I guess, you know, it, it's also uh, an individual choice. Um, in terms of, of where you go and where you want to struggle. But <laughs> the issue is, as we talked about is, are you clear about who you are, your identity as an African person, your role and responsibility to our struggle? Do you recognize that we are at war? Uh, you know, those kinds of things are important because a lot of people, I think Jared shared quite, you know, profoundly, and I appreciate him saying that when he came to CAU, he was at a certain place. And you can go through your life and be 60, 70, and, and, and may not have a, the, the kind of consciousness that I think we are grappling with here that we think we need to be able to ascertain whether or not things that are things that people are doing, you know, are, are really moving us towards freedom. If you even think that we're not free, if you even have that understanding, because not everybody does. So, and it doesn't even matter whether you're at a PWI or HBCU. So well, if you I know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because we can't, we have to remember when, when was, when we talk about AU and CAU political science, um, we're talking about the specific department on the campus. Has the university ever embraced the ideas of the AU, CAU political science department and its rationale and its reason for being? So we can't act like, you know, HBCUs are this thing that supports this whole idea of liberation and, and you know, that that's the project that these HBCUs have. I, I, don't, I don't think that, I don't know the one that, that does in terms that's of the institution good. itself. Um, that's, go ahead. That's, that's important. That's an that's, important point. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Denzel. No, I I think I think that's an important question to acknowledge. But it goes back to Kelly, which you talked about is parochialism, or I mean, echoing Dr. Jones' comments about uh, about groups. Is that necessarily a negative thing, or is that and we had this conversation organic to how communities develop. So on, on the one hand, we can talk about hostility to ideas, but we can also talk about how do people develop and grow as human beings and in, in, in knowledge production and moving from the parochial to the universal. So just in terms of doing work, we need to be in spaces where we start off saying, what should we think? And for the most part, the time you spent, the time you spent is around people you can define as we. And I think that that becomes that becomes the contradiction. If if you're at HBCU and it's hostile, you gotta find space where you have those conversations to build and to grow and develop in the context of our community and our people. That could be in the HBCU, that could be in the community, that could be in both. And it's the same with P people who are make our living primarily in the context of PWIs, because that's where the careerism is. Where do we get our resources at this juncture in our development? since we don't have a level of economic independence. But, but being able to be in that space where you're talk, talking mostly to our folk, where you're doing 
work in the interest of our folk and where you're, inter you're, you're institutionalizing processes and ways of being for our folk, how do we increase more and more time doing that? I think is the fundamental question, regardless of where you uh, make your income. But that is a question because that becomes a contradiction, right? Where we make our money, how we make our money, and which social space is that in? But I don't, I don't think it's just a question of, uh, uh, again, these external forces. It's where do we begin? And based on where do we begin, how do we respond to those external forces? You know, even, a, even the way we teach, like, and it gets on that level, the, uh, and I'll end here. It's like the challenges that people have, like, for course development at PWIs is very, can be, or is very different than at HBCUs. So in the HBCU context, the class can be, you can have, you can have a moniker like American politics or international politics, but literally in the class is how does black, how does, how should black people engage? Everything is black kids, you know, that whole idea. Everything becomes black studies in HBCU context. The name becomes to some degree superfluous. We study American politics, it's through the black lens. If we study international politics, it's through the black lens. You study comparative politics, it's through the black lens. And you can pose the question, how should we look at this? This is the material we're using, you know, but then in a PWI context, you got to play that politic a little differently, given who's in the classroom, who's in administration, you know, and I'm not going to say that's uniform. That's been my experience, but I think it is relevant. Who do we talk to and work with most of the time? And how does that impact the work we do, the way we write, the way we conceptualize and talk about things? Thank you. you know, we have, we have, that's a great point. One thing I will add to that, um, mm -hmm. Kelly's uh, previous point, um, uh, that's, that's, a, that's an important point. Not all HBCUs are the same, and as I'm sure that, as Denzel just said, all uh, PWIs aren't the same. Um, but to the extent that an, an Atlanta school exists, and I believe it does, I think we can demonstrate that, um, one should not be confused that if it exists, it exists because of struggle in the space that we're in. I, um, uh, the, the mere fact 50 years later that we have still having this conversation is not just because the, 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 the ideas that Mac laid out and the attempt to create a particular kind of doctoral program here, which then becomes the, uh, the organizing principle of the entire department by the time the cons consolidation takes place. Um, that is a part in a reflection of this notion of struggle that the very work itself is trying to grapple with. Uh, it becomes a microcosm of a broader type of struggle, um, which means that it's a constant process of realizing that effort that started in 1971 and certainly be before that, as Errol suggested in some of his, uh, um, a couple of his questions there. Um, and so then it is through that constant work that we create a space for, to do what Densu was saying we do. Uh, and then we have to struggle to protect that space, right? So one should be clear that um, um, the same kind of challenges that confront, would confront an effort like this at a PWI. Uh, and sometimes, and often there's an ebb and a flow. Sometimes here at an HBCU, they are uh, um, contested and other times um, there, there's space to uh, flourish when we have, for example, administrative leadership who understands us, right? Um, my last point, I wanna say something to Errol's point. I should not give the impression that everyone who comes out of the Atlanta school is a Pan-Africanist. Uh, we have uh, we have differences, we have arguments, we have debates, but what we are saying is that there is a creation of the of a space that is to capture, institutionalize a pedagogical approach, as Jared has mentioned, a methodological approach that reflects much of what we can see as we're talking about Baba Mac here. There are others. It's not just Mac. There are others, but as we capture in Baba Baba Mac's work, um, uh, notions of the black predicament notions of the production of a social science that emerges out of the experiences of African people, 
the nature of that political reality for the production of scholarship and knowledge that we do as scholars. Everyone who comes to the program through this Atlanta school is exposed to that. And in many cases, it goes where that individual has their feet planted, so to speak, both philosophically and, and as Densu was suggesting, also professionally, right? Um, and the Pan-African aspect is just one, one part of it. Uh, it's a large part of it. Um, when I came into the program, I did not come with a knowledge of the pantheon, if you will, of, of, pan, of, of, of thinkers who came out of the uh, um, department or uh, who were parts of uh, ENCOPES. I came out of a particular family-based proximity to a kind of struggle, right? Um, I brought that with me to the department and it was because of that understanding that I had that the department spoke to me and it made sense. And it was later that I was able to uh, connect my own personal and family experiences to um, this, this space. But I would also argue that it is that thing that Densu is talk, talking about that exists in this, uh, uh, what we are calling an Atlanta school that allows it to continue because we constantly have new students coming to us who have their own experiences, right? And how we then speak to those experiences in a very systematic way. Again, you will have others that, as I hear Jared articulating that will come to us who uh, may not have known uh, um, uh, some of these other um, um, names that we've talked about. Um, but the outcome is, again, the creation of a, of a, of a space. And I would argue to the extent that um, one can exist, this is sort of a liberated zone. The institution in general might not be, but the department becomes a sort of a liberated zone. I look around and I don't see too many other spaces like us. Right, who can do many of the things that uh, um, we, we, we proclaim, you know, look at the persons that we bring for, for seminar. And that's always been the case. The, the seminar has always been a space uh, for individuals to come and to bring discussions that um, were not so welcomed in other parts of the academy. I, I'll stop there because I don't know. You know, you, know, uh, you know, it's interesting to this particular discussion. When I was an undergraduate, I double majored in African American studies and political science. So the political science at Temple University, so the political science chair, I'm talking to him about graduate school, and he know I'm talking all this stuff about revolution and all liberation and all this stuff. He said, well, when you go to graduate school, you probably should think about Clark Atlanta or Howard, <laughs> because this ain't the space for that, <laughs> right? He, he, at that time, he was clear. It, Temple ain't the space for it in terms of political science, to have those kind of meaningful discussions and all that. It wasn't the space for it. At the time, it was. Clark Atlanta University and Howard University. Now, I'm not saying that they don't have it like at Michigan and other places, because I know folks go to other, other places. They carve out these spaces, you know, where you can um, deal with these issues. But going back to the central point, there, there's a question that Dr. Jones always raised that I still think we have to grapple with as, a, as an organization in terms of NCOPES. And, that, and Kurt said it right. I talked about dealing with professional peace, but it's the careerism I'm worried about that I really don't have no, you know, want to grapple, deal with. But the point, the, the question Dr. Jones raised is, what is the nature of the good life? What, so it, what is that nature of the good life for us in the context in which we live? Not 500 years ago, but right now in 2021, what is the nature of the good life? And i never forget too, uh, Dr. Jones in one presentation had said, he raised the question, I'm not saying that he said this is the, the case, but he said, well, maybe when we consider Black congressional representation, that then you know, a black president, this was before Obama, but now that we have a black had a black quote unquote black president, now that we consider all the things that black people have done in society politically and, and the things that do, maybe we've done as much as we can in this society. That's another question we ought to consider. And that connected to this whole nature of the good life. What is possible? Right? So that's where we really have to have that empirical work and connected with our normative. Uh, prescriptions. We got to really ground it in empirical observations. And, and in 2021, in the United States, and I think that we still haven't done that work. I would say, you know, we've gone more than 30 minutes over time, and this is a precursor for October. You see, we've left so many, we've just started the discourse. And so we have a whole conference where you'll be able to lay out all of these issues, address uh, the building blocks in great detail, 
address this issue of concrete analysis of concrete conditions in the 21st century, address, I mean, if we are a school, I mean, how do we lay out the parameters of this school? What is the relationship between scholarship and activism? Can scholarship just by itself be activism? I mean, there are just a array of just kind of issues that we've begun to address. And uh, as I said, we are more than uh, 30 minutes over time and some people might want to go to other panels. But as a moderator, I, I will just bring this to an end. I thank everybody. I thank the presenters. I thank the people who were in the audience. I thank the chat. I thank my students for allowing me uh, 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 this uh, uh, role. And most of all, it's just a delight to see Mac Jones. Mac Jones, uh, a brilliant teacher. And Everybody unmute and, and clap for Dr. Jones. Yay, let us hear yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Does he have some last words, please? Doc, uh, yeah, that's you know, appropriate, 30 appropriate. seconds. Can yeah. he? We, we already are. Yeah. So. <laughs> yes. Now I just want to say thanks to everybody. I'm feeling like an old man today. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, old man. <laughs> well, well done, Jack. Now, Jack. Now. All right. <laughs> shout out! Shout out to Tayari and the books she's doing. She's doing great work. Oh, yes. yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. I mean, when we when we talk, at, we all talk and smack that you know that Mac Jones is our father and things like that. She just would go, Mac is by <laughs> father. All you people are just. So okay. when the pandemic is over, we're going to have a party. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> all right. All right. So yeah. <laughs> all right, y'all. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Yes. yes. Have a great day. All right. Okay. Well, done. well done. Well done. Hey, Sue. Hey.